Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith and review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Without condemnation, to call upon the heavenly God as upon a Father and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and under the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Father and Hierarch Ambrose, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Thank you, Father Joseph. Uh, Dr. Marshner, you're up. Number three out of three. Okay. Thank you, Sabatino. Now, when we begin to discuss the controversies over the Holy Spirit between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, we need to know that um, part of the controversy goes back to a difference in method on uh, a difference in method in how to theologize about the Trinity. Okay? Not a difference in doctrine. That's another story. That's controversial. But certainly a difference in method. Okay? The difference in method had its origin in the difference between the Cappadocian fathers on the one hand that's St. Basil of Caesarea, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and St. Gregory Nazianzen. Those are the three Cappadocian fathers. The difference is between them in the East and St. Augustine in the West. Augustine having been the bishop of this little town called Hippo in North Africa. And the only reason he was bishop there is because he made the mistake of passing through town when their bishop had recently passed away. In those days, if you were an accomplished Christian writer, apologist, anything like that, you had to be very careful what town you passed through. <laughs> because people would grab you and really. Anyway, um, <clears throat> here's the difference. Do we start with the three persons? and then try to explain how they are one? Or do we start with the one God and then try to explain how the three persons arise? Okay. If you start with the three persons and then try to explain why they're one God, you are doing theology the way the Cappadocian fathers did. Okay? Because for them, the crucial question was, why aren't there three gods? We got Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God. We got, why isn't that three gods? Okay? Just as Tom, Dick, and Harry are three men, why aren't Father, Son, and Spirit three gods? Okay? So they... They, they take the trinity of persons and then try to explain why Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not like Tom, Dick, and Harry. So that you don't end up with three gods. Yes? St. Augustine, working in the West, didn't have that problem. He's also a couple hundred years later. He didn't have that problem. For him... The issue was to start 
with the plain biblical fact of divine oneness. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Yes. God is one. We've never denied it. This is called monotheism. Yes. We've never denied it. How do you get from the one being, which is, by essence, God, to the three who, in some way, share that essence? Okay. If you go about the thing in St. Augustine's direction, then one of the most important words in your vocabulary is the word procession. Three persons arise out of the divine oneness because the person of the Son proceeds from the Father. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, at least. <laughs> okay. So it's that proceeding business that has to be put front and center and explained. Now then, I want to knock in the head the idea that these two directions of working towards the mystery are incompatible. Okay? There was a very heavyweight work of scholarship put out in the 1890s by a theologian named T.H. Deregnon, R-E-G-N-O-N, claiming that this difference between East and West was profound and just led to enormous differences, Duranyon's scholarship is not good. Okay? It's not reliable stuff. And a lot of scholarship, especially scholarship quoted in the East, still goes back to the work of Duranyon and hence is not reliable. One of the pieces of evidence you need that it's not reliable is this. One of the most important of all the great theologians of the Eastern Church, writing in Greek, was St. Maximus the Confessor. Okay? Maximus the Confessor. Absolutely a great man. And he lived late enough that he could read Augustine's huge treatise on the Trinity, De Trinitate, in Latin. He knew his Latin, he could read it, and St. Maximus said, there is no fundamental difference in our doctrine. Okay? Now, who do you want to trust? Some French scholar from the gay 90s or Maximus the Confessor? <laughs> anyway. When you begin the way St. Augustine did begin and start with the divine unity and then by way of processions reach the trinity of persons, you need to reflect very carefully on the difference between what is substance in God and what is relation in God. Okay? Now, I'm going to spend some time going over these technical terms a bit. But before I do, I want to read you a passage from St. Augustine. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful passage, unprecedented in his day, and uh, pregnant with important results for the whole Middle Ages. This is from book five of his De Trinitate. And it brings out the difference that I want to discuss with you between substance and relation. All right? Forgive my translation. Here goes St. Augustine. In God, nothing is said on the basis of accident because there is nothing changeable in him. And yet, not everything that is said of God 
is said on the basis of substance. Now then, I'm going to stop the quotation for a minute because some of you may have Aristotelian ears. Okay? When you hear the word substance, you think, oh yeah, and the opposite of that is an accident. Remember Aristotle's categories? Ten categories, substance, and then nine kinds of accident. And the categories were supposed to be the pigeonholes in which you could put anything we find in being. Anything real should go into one or another of those pigeonholes. Well, all the independently existing things that we run into, like dogs, cats, people, uh, planets, should go into the substance pigeonhole. And everything else, like being green, weighing so much, being so big, all the properties like that should go into the other pigeonholes, all of which can be called accidents. Right? Now then, if you are hearing me with those nicely trained Aristotelian ears, for which I compliment you, you will have already had a red flag go up in your mind. How can it be the case that nothing is true of God on an accidental basis and yet be true that not everything true of God is true on the basis of substance? Because some things he's going to say are true on the basis of relation. All right. So, uh, fans of Aristotle's ten categories, just beware. We're entering here into strange territory. I read on. There are things said relatively to others when we talk about God. Thus, father in relation to son, son in relation to father. And in God, that is not an accident because the one is forever father and the other is forever son. And when I say forever, I don't just mean in the sense that once the son is born, he's always going to exist. And so the father will never stop being his father. No, no, no. I mean it in the sense that since forever, from all eternity, the son is born. And he never began to be. He never began to be the son. If he had at some point begun to be the son, or if he were going to cease to be someday, eh, he would be called son uh, on the basis of an accident. On the contrary, if the father were only called the father in terms of himself. In other words, if no relation were involved. If he were only called father in terms of himself and not in relation to his son. And likewise, if the son were only called son in relation to himself and not in relation to the father, then these words, father and son, would be true of God on the basis of substance. But, such is not the case. As the father is only called father because he has a son, and the son is only called the son because he has a father, this is not on a substance basis that they are so called. Because these names relate the one to the other. Okay? And yet it's not accident. It's not accident. 
For if the Father is called Father and the Son, Son, what these names indicate is still eternal and unchangeable. Eternal and unchangeable. And also, while there's a difference between being Father and being Son, their substance is not different. Their substance is not different. Because they're not named that way on the basis of substance. But on the basis of relation. A relation, however, which is not an accident because it is immutable. Okay? Now then, I've taken you through the whole text. It is one of the most pioneering texts in the history of Trinitarian theology. It maketh one to think. Okay? People had talked for a long time about procession in God, the words in the Bible after all, but that procession had to be understood in terms of relation, that the, pe the persons differed from one another thanks to relation and not substance. That also was not altogether new, but Augustine gives it new emphasis. Okay? And draws some lessons for the people that I call Aristotelian fundamentalists. Okay? Aristotelian fundamentalists think that even the divine being fits right in those ten categories. Okay? That God has to be substance, period. And any traits of his that aren't identically his substance have to be accidents. Thus far, Aristotelian fundamentalists. Okay? Fortunately, most of those people teach in Roman Catholic institutions, and so they don't say this out loud. Otherwise, <laughs> we'd have some new heresy trials. Okay? No, 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 no. The divine being is off the chart of Aristotle's ten categories. He does not fit. Okay. And St. Thomas puts it like this. God unites in himself all the fullness of substance and all the fullness of relation. He's not tied down to being either one. He's both because he transcends the difference. Yeah. Well, enough about Aristotle. Enough about this point so far. I now want to make sure that you understand why um, relations are usually said to be accidents in Aristotle's sense. An accident is any property which a thing can gain or lose without ceasing to exist in its kind. Okay? An accident is any property a thing can gain or lose without ceasing to exist in its kind. So, for example, being dirty is an accident. I, even I, have survived washing. <laughs> Having three inch long hair is an accident even on dogs because they survive a trip to the grooming shop. Okay. There are less trivial examples, but let's leave it at that for the time being. All right. Now, um, on the other hand, <laughs> having a living body is not exactly accidental to me. Okay? I am not just my soul. Oh, would that I were. <laughs> no, I am not just my soul. Okay? I'm a body-soul composite. Having my body is not accidental to me. This is why. If I step on a landmine, 
and have my body separated into many small pieces at great distance from one another, I don't survive. Okay? Blow me up well enough and there's no human being left. Right? Okay. Now, we clearly understand that God doesn't change. Okay? He is not sometimes pleased with us and sometimes angry. No. Okay. We, we deserve differently from him from time to time because we change. Okay. It's as though God is always extending his justice and extending his mercy, both at once, all the time, we change from which of them we're under, right? But God doesn't change. Okay. When Adam fell, God the Father did not go into a tiff. Not at all. There are no emotions, no changes of that kind in God. Are you with me? God doesn't get bigger or shrink. I do. You do. Mostly I get bigger these days. But I think in about 20 years I'll start shrinking down again, probably, if I live that long. I grow, I shrink, God does not. He's eternally the same. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Are we on that sheet of music together? There are no accidents in God. Okay? My knowledge is an accident to me. I wasn't born with it. And I don't, nothing compelled me in my nature to acquire it. Okay? I read books out of free decision. And whatever knowledge I have, I'm sorry to say, I can lose again. It's an accident to me. God's knowledge is no accident to him. He eternally and unchangeably knows everything he knows. Wills everything he wills, and so on and so on. So his intellect, his will, his being eternal, his being infinite, all of those things are non-accidental. They are eternal traits in God. And all of those traits end up being the same thing, with a capital T, the same reality. Let me ask you this. God's love and God's wisdom. Is your love the same as your wisdom? No. Okay? In us, there are different things. Are they different things in God? No. Are they different things from his substance? No. Okay? God is love, says St. John. God is wisdom. God is infinite intelligence. God is infinite being. All those things he just is. Because he managed to be all of those things just in being the one incomprehensible, transcendental thing which he is. Make sense to everybody? Okay. So all of those properties that we were just talking about in God meld together and become one. They're one thing. But, Augustine says, and we know this is true from the Bible again, that besides these traits, these attributes of oneness and eternity and infinity and so on, there are also these relations in God, okay? Whereby the Father stands to the Son in the relation Father of, and the Son back to the Father in relation Son of. And likewise, the spirator and the Holy Spirit. So there are these relations in God. They don't come and go. They're certainly not accidental in that sense. They don't come and go. They're there eternally. But they don't collapse into one thing either. Exactly. 
Why not? This is big. When we talk about this and that in God, his various attributes, the three persons, and so on, we find the following enormous difference between the three persons and everything else we mention in God. This enormous difference. The three persons are three. They are distinct. Really distinct one from another. Okay? And yet, everything else in God fails to be distinct. His wisdom is not distinct from his love. His mercy is not distinct from his justice. His intellect is not distinct from his will. But being the father is distinct from being the son. Okay? When we talk about distinction in God, what's distinct in God? The answer is very simple. The three persons are distinct from one another. Other than that, there is zero distinct in God. Everything comes together in a oneness that we can't understand, but which, you, which we can talk about, okay? But we can't imagine it, okay? Because in us, all of these properties don't come together. My will is not my intellect, and my love is certainly not my justice, right? And my wisdom is usually gone anyway. In us, these things are all different, but in God, no. All right, then. What is it about relations that make it the case that you can have this relation in God, that relation in God, but in the end, they don't just become identical, the way his intellect and his will become identical? What's funny about them? What's peculiar about relations? Okay. The answer, derived from reflection on the point we just read in St. Augustine, the answer has to do with relational opposition. Certain relations are flat out opposed to one another. Now then, let me see if we can help with the blackboard here. I know people don't like to talk about relations. It's more fun to talk about your relatives. <laughs> but relations are a little abstract for most of us. <laughs> Still, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's reflect on some obvious things. Okay. Suppose X is son of Y. Okay. X has the relation to Y, which is called being his son. What relation does Y have back to X? Yep. So Y is father of X. Can anybody be son of himself? No. Can anybody be father of himself? No. You can only be a father vis-a-vis -vis another person. And that person cannot be your father. You can't be the father of your own father. Have you noticed that? You have to be his son. Okay. What I'm talking about here is the fact that these two relations converse. C-O-N-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Right? We find this phenomenon throughout the logic and the being of relations. Suppose the relation is that I am fatter than you. What's your relation back to me? Yes, then you are thinner than I. Right? Okay. If I am bigger than you, then you're smaller than I am. If I'm taller than you, then you're shorter than me. Right? Which is bad grammar, but correct relation theory. Right? 
Sometimes, this can be a little hard to see because sometimes my relation to somebody else and that person's relation back to me have the same name, but they're still not the same relation. Okay? Consider the relation X is married to Y. If X is married to Y, is Y married to X? Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. And yet, the relations are not the same, except in name, because they each have a different direction in them. My relation is to my wife. Her relation is to me. So there's always a converse relation. Wherever there's a relation, there's a converse relation. This also happens when you're uh, engaged in various sorts of movements, fights and changes and so on. Suppose the relation is X hit Y. Then Y's relation back to X is was hit by. You just go into the passive voice. Only reason I mention that is because I wanted you to see that wherever we talk of relations, there is a converse relation. Every relation has a converse relation. Sometimes it has the same name, but usually they have contrasting names. Is that okay? Okay. Converse relations cannot be identical. Okay. A relation going this way cannot be at the same time going that way. Right. When one relation is converse to another, that's called relative opposition. Okay. Relative opposition or relational opposition. When one relation is converse to another, that's what we mean by relative opposition when we are talking sacred theology. Okay? I know in family life it's something else. Relative opposition is a fight over the inheritance. <laughs> but in, <laughs> in theology, relative opposition arises when one relation is the converse of the other. Now, what makes the Son of God the Son of God? Answer, his eternal relation to the Father. What makes God the Father to be God the Father? Answer, his eternal relation to the Son. With me? But those two relations are converse to each other. Therefore, it cannot be the case that the Father just is the Son. Now, let me replay this just a little bit, going back to uh, ordinary attributes of God, where I say this kind of distinction vanishes. Okay. God is very strange in that, in him, his intellect is not a different thing from his will. Okay? Now then, is intellect from will? is will from intellect? Are they defined by a relation to each other? No. Okay. Intellect and will are not relational properties. Okay. And so they can't be relatively opposed to one another. And so they're free to merge in God and become one and the same thing. Only relative opposition prevents one thing from being identical to another in God. I would say that again. Only relative opposition prevents one thing from being the same as another in God. Okay? Can you imagine this being? No, don't try. He's every bit as bad as abstract algebra. Weird groups that aren't commutative and stuff like that. All right? 
You can do their math, but you can't imagine them. And so it is with God. You cannot imagine a being who works that way. But this is the biblical data. Because we're told of Father, we're told of Son, we're told of Holy Spirit. We're told that the one sends the other. Huh? The one is from the other. If X is from Y, then Y is not from X. If X is from Y, then Y is the source or origin of X. Eh? Converse relations again. And so we discover that when one person proceeds from another, converse relations are posited. If X is from Y, then Y is the source or origin of X. And those two are converse relations. Does everybody see? Yeah. And now then, I'm finally turning to the topic of the Holy Spirit. Sorry about the long wind-up. It was necessary. The debate between the Eastern Church and the Western Church was over whether the Holy Spirit proceeded, came from, originated from the Father alone, or whether he also had some sort of origin or procession from the Son. The Eastern Church said he does, the Spirit does not proceed from the Son, period. The Latin Church said he did. All right? This was at most, at most, a semantic quarrel aggravated by bad feelings on both sides. Well, I mean, after all, if the Latins had recently come and sacked your capital city, you'd be angry too. Uh, plenty of bad feelings on both sides, but look, Latin had one general verb. If one thing comes from another thing in any which way, as a stream comes from a spring, as a leaf comes from a stalk, as a stalk comes from a root, as rain comes from the sky, if one thing comes from another thing in any way whatsoever, they used, the Latins did, they used the verb procedere. Okay? That was their general word for one thing coming from another, any which way. And this verb in Latin was important biblically because it's in John 15, 26. If I got my verse right? I do believe so. John 15, 26 says, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. Okay? And in that, uh, in Latin, that is qui ex patre pro Chade it, prochade it from the verb prochadere to proceed. This word, of course, does not exist in the Greek text of the New Testament. No surprises there, it wasn't written in Latin. But the word there in the Greek had a special technical sense in Greek usage. And let us see what we can say about that. In the Greek, the text says, you'll kill me if I put it up in Greek, won't you? To ek tu patros ek porel etai. E-K-P-O-R-E-U-E-T-A-I. Ek poreletai. From the verb, the verb ek porelestai. That tells you a lot, doesn't it? Anyway, it's, that's the infinitive. Ek porelestai is the Greek word for to proceed. But 
It's not a general verb, like procedere in Latin. It's a very particular verb. It has a narrower meaning because, well, I mean, let's face it, Greek always had a much larger vocabulary than Latin. Okay? You can sympathize with that. Because English has an enormous vocabulary. And you're always surprised and amused when you go into a foreign language where one and the same word is used in ways for which you would require two words. Okay? You're in France. You're in an elevator, and the darn thing won't go up. What do you say? L'ascenseur ne marche pas. Which sounds very funny. If you bring it directly into English, the elevator does not march. <laughs> French has marché with a very general usage. Basically, any kind of going is marché. But in English, we can't do that. We have different verbs. You can't say the elevator doesn't march. You are with me so far? All right. Alongside this nice general, I'm sorry, alongside this very specific verb, ek poreletai, Greek also had a verb, pro e anai. <sighs> Which also means to go forth from. Okay? I'm sure that to a Greek in the streets, they were basically synonymous. But for those with technical expertise, the difference between them can be illustrated by a diagram. Okay? I want you to picture a circle. And I want you to think of a radius of that circle. Okay? The radius is going from the center to the circumference. Have I got that word right? Right? And now let's suppose that this radius is ambitious and doesn't stay in the circle. It goes forth beyond the circle. Ha! There we go. This is a very energetic radius. If you ask, from what point or points does this radius go forth? You can say, well, it goes forth from this one, that's the center, but since it passes on beyond that one, it also passes through that one, it goes forth from that one. And if that's how you're thinking, you're thinking the way the Latins did with their verb procedere. But for the Greeks, their verb, ek poreletai, had the sense of coming only from an absolute starting point. Okay. In other words, a point from which you would start, but which you wouldn't go through. Start from it, but don't go through it. That would have to be the center, wouldn't it? Okay, so the Greeks would say that this line, this here radius, Ekpo, it ekpo relati from the center, and it pro ye goes forth pro yei from the circumference. So you can say it, it goes forth from both, but only the center is its absolute starting point. Is everybody clear with this? Okay. The Latins didn't have these two verbs. They were like the French with their marché. And so they said that the line prochade it. The Latins would say they, it prochade it from the center and also prochade it from the circumference because it went on beyond, it, it went from both of them. Does everybody see? There is nothing more serious here in the real fight between East and West 
than this business of semantics. Okay? Aquinas thought that the point was so obvious that prochetere was just a very, a, a verb with an enormously broad usage that the Greeks had to be playing mind games or they were stupid not to see, but they weren't. They were simply speaking a different language. And with a little good faith, translation is possible, right? When you want to make fun of the French, you say, the elevator doesn't march. When you want to be nice to them, you say, the elevator isn't going. It's an elevator. OK. Now then, think of the center as God the Father. Think of the circumference as God the Son. And think of the radius itself as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, ek poreletai, from the Father, proie from the Son. You can say that he goes forth from the Father through the Son. Dia the Greeks were willing to say that. Okay? But they weren't willing to say that he proceeds from the Son. To them, that would mean from two absolute starting points, which nobody ever wanted to say. Nobody. So all the Latins had to do was say, okay, well, all right. Let's get together here. Let's, let's not worry so much about the verb procedere. Let's just fix the problem with, prop, with prepositions. Okay? We'll say, we'll all say, the Holy Spirit proceeds, ek, from the Father, through the Son. Is that okay? And when the Greeks were of a mind to make peace, yeah, that's what we believe. Okay. But in the creed to which they took objection in the Latin church, it doesn't say that. See, this is the real problem. The creed says, qui ex patre filioque procedit. That means ex both. Ex the father and ex the son. From the father and from the son he proceeds. And that was a red flag. Okay. All right. Here's the really tough one. This gets us back to what I started with. Never mind. The semantic quarrel, I'm telling you, can be fixed. Here's the tough one. If the Holy Spirit did not proceed in any way from the Son, but only from the Father. Could he still be distinct from the Son? If he didn't come from the Son as well as from the Father, could he still be distinct from the Son? Okay. Well, the Greeks said, of course, because of the procedere business and the ek parelatai business. The Latins, however, only had the verb procedere, and so they debated it. Okay? They debated, and uh, nobody knows about this debate. St. Anselm okay? and uh, Duns Scotus and a gazillion other people said, well, look, since the Son is begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeds, simply on that basis they would be distinct. So it wouldn't have to be true that the Spirit is also from the Son. He could still be distinct from the Son. Eh? Aquinas took the other side. All right? And I think very much the right side because this ties up the question of the Holy Spirit with this fundamental rule of talking about the Trinity. Okay? Only relative opposition yields distinction within the triune God. Hmm? If the Holy Spirit were in no way from the Son, he would not have any relation in which he's relatively opposed 
to the Son. And then he would not be distinct from the Son. In other words, the from issue, is he from him in any way, is vital to his being distinct. If the Son were not from the Father, begotten from the Father, originating from the Father, would he be distinct from the Father? On what basis? Is he younger? No. Does he have a different divine nature? No. Does he differ from the Father in any absolute property? Is he smaller than the Father? Uh, 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 is the father smart and the son dumb? Huh? Is the father mean and the son nice? They don't differ in any absolute property. They differ only by their relations. If they were not in converse relations to each other, they would not be distinct. St. Thomas says the same applies to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, um, I'm out of time. This is again fortunate for you. <laughs> because if I had more time, I would probably bring in the arguments launched against the Western way of speaking by... Uh, Focius, Patriarch Phocius the Great. I could give you Phocius's arguments against the West. Huh? Not all of them. <laughs> but fortunately, his little book is very repetitious. But he's got a couple of... Uh, but, but we're out of time. So here's the deal. We're going to take, a, what, a five-minute break? <laughs> Four, minutes. three... Two. 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 God, we're going to take a two-minute break, and then I will take a couple of questions, and maybe you'll, unfortunately, maybe you'll raise those. Thank you, Dr. Merster. Okay. If, if you uh, felt yourself getting a little giddy and excited as Dr. Marshall was speaking, but you didn't quite understand what he was talking about. That was me for four years at Christendom College. I think I took 13 semester courses from him. All right, I asked Dr. Marshall also to give us a little, um, just a, a quick historical context of what he was talking about, his division between the East and the West, uh, and so forth. So maybe just a quick, for those that aren't familiar with the, the problem and so forth. Okay, I, well, I, everything I've talked about so far is the matter of fact within the Trinity, okay? What it says in John's Gospel is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, okay? Then that language went directly into the Creed, as it was agreed to by East and West uh, in 381 and subsequent councils. We don't know exactly when. But at some point in the Western Church, the custom arose of adding the phrase, and from the Son. Proceeds from the Father, and from the Son, which in Latin is the one word filioque. We think that the custom began in Spain, in Visigothic Spain, because there were some church councils there, before the Arabs came and took over Spain, there were some church councils there that, that discussed this business. From Spain, it spread to the court of Charlemagne. Okay? And then by the middle of the 9th century AD, that's 800 and something, the 9th century AD, it had spread down to Rome, but was only beginning in Rome. Okay? Rome knew about the custom from elsewhere in the Western world, and agreed with the theology that supported the custom. Okay. And so didn't make any kind of a, a fuss about it. When Phocius the Great, Patriarch of Constantinople, in about the year 860, um, wanted to... Um, uh, well, never mind what he wanted to do. But, uh, 
it, it, it included uh, breaking off from the West. Uh, he insisted that that two word, I mean, that one word addition, filioque, was heretical. Okay. Flat out heretical. Now then, what am I saying about it? Do I think it's heretical? No. Do I think it's uncanonical? Yes. There never was an ecumenical council that put this in the creed. There wasn't even one in the West that took up the question. Should we put this in the creed? What do you think? There was never any discussion. It snuck in. Okay? Well, I mean, look, come on. If the, Greek, if, if, if the Greeks and the Russians want to wrap me over the knuckles for belonging to a church in which, you know, from time to time, some things have been done uncanonically, fine. Because I got plenty to wrap them back about. <laughs> All right. But if you're going to say it's heresy, that's another story. Okay? Is that an 860 is when the whole fuss started. Now, questions? Could you please give us a brief rundown on uh, Photius's um, arguments against um, the filioque? Oh. Quick, that was quick, Dr. Marshall. Quick. All right. <laughs> Here's one of his arguments. If the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son, then he must be getting something extra by coming from the Son. Because if he proceeded perfectly from the Father, he wouldn't need to come also from the Son. But you can't deny that he proceeds perfectly from the Father. Ergo, your position is horrible. Okay? And our answer to that is, he comes from the Father and the Son not as two sources, but as one. Because the Father and the Son are not relatively opposed in terms of spirating the Holy Spirit. Okay? So it's, it's not as though he doesn't get everything he needs from the Father and has to get something else from the Son. No. Besides, everything that the Father has is mine, says the Son. Remember that? He's talking about absolute properties. Every bit of eternalness that the Father has is mine, can say the Son says. That means every bit of power that the Father has is mine, says the Son. That's correct. Now then, this means that the power to engender the Holy Spirit, or spirate the Holy Spirit, belongs to the Father and the Son. It's identical. It's not that the Father has one power and the Son has another, and you've got to put them together to get the deal like a, car, like a car that needed two batteries to start. No, no, no. It's one and the same power of spiration. Common to the Father and the Son. Here's another one. Okay? And then we're, we're going we're gonna to about pack this up because I know that you're all very merciful. <laughs> Unlike that guy in the seersucker suit. <laughs> Here's another one. All right. This is one of my favorites. In the little book on the mystagogy of the Holy Spirit by the patriarch Phocius the Great. In God, every property which is not unique to one person is common to all three because it belongs to the divine essence. Being Father is unique to one. Being Holy Spirit is unique to one. Being wise is common to all three. Okay? Now this is how to talk about the Trinity. Along come you Latins with this funny idea that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. That means there are two persons, Father and Son, both spirating the Spirit. Well, if that property belongs to 
not just one person but two, then it has to belong to all three. Then it's part of the divine essence. And since the Holy Spirit has the divine essence, he spirates himself. How do you like that? Okay. I'm sorry, but I can't resist turning that argument around on our dear patriarch friend. Look, you say every property that is not unique to one divine person belongs to all three and hence is in the divine essence. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, uh, I want you to consider the property of originating from God the Father. The Son has it. The Holy Spirit has it. Therefore, originating from the Father must be essential in God, and the Father originates from himself. Of course you can have properties that befit two people, I mean, sorry, two persons in God, and not all three, when you look at the relations. In other words, Phocius's rule of applies perfectly correctly to the attributes and absolute properties in God. It does not apply when you look at the relations. Oh, ah, 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 ah. Here's another one. How about the property of having another person proceed from you? Okay, I'm thinking like a Latin now. How about the property of having another person proceed from you? The Father has it because the Son does. The Son has it because the Holy Spirit does. Right, Filio Quay fans? But nobody proceeds from the Holy Spirit. Right? Did we just kick the Holy Spirit out of the divine essence? No. Thank you, Dr. Merster. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.